Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's special Canadian Public Health Week 2024 webinar on the role of public health professionals in the age of artificial intelligence. My name is Ian Culbert. I am the executive of the Canadian Public Health Association, and I'm very pleased to be able to provide the platform for today's uh, webinar. Uh, and while we are all joining from different uh, parts of Turtle Island, I would like to acknowledge that CPHA's offices are located on the ancestral and unseen the territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Uh, today's webinar is being hosted by the Public Health Association of British Columbia. And to get things rolling, I will turn things over to Shannon Turner, the Executive Director. Shannon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ian. And thanks again to CPHA for always providing the coordinating strength and passion for public health in Canada. We are so grateful to partner with you and uh, so appreciative of all of the work you do on policy and evidence and support for uh, ensuring that uh, we have a public health infrastructure strategy and programming going forward. Uh, the voices of public health are critical in the uh, political discourse, and today's presentation is really focusing on an impending and actually fully present challenge that um, we anticipate confronting uh, in the next uh, decade significantly. My um, Our work in this area is consistent with our interest in being uh, progressive advocates for uh, protection and promotion of population and public health. I am delighted to join you from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen and um, Songhees people in um, Victoria, British Columbia. My pronouns are she, her, and uh, it's a privilege uh, to be here with you in this space and uh, I'm very grateful for the fact that we can share this nationally, because I think that in British Columbia in particular, we've done some significant work. And one of the key architects of that work has been our presenter today, Dr. Alex Choi. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Choi. Um, it's been my privilege to work with her through Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. Dr. Choi is a medical health officer. She's a dual certified family physician and public health specialist physician and a clinical instructor at the University of British Columbia. She holds a medical degree from McMaster's, a master's degree in clinical epidemiology from UBC, and has served populations through public health work at the local, regional, and international levels. She's also an MHO with a particular passion for understanding the implications and impacts of technology and was a scientific co-chair for us at our conference this year on public health and equity in the digital age in Vancouver last November with Dr. Shannon Freeman. Um, PHABC's got a significant uh, footprint in the digital space and my background is in fact in health informatics and my doctoral research is on uh, uh, digital health, digital uh, equity and um, health promotion and what we need to do in terms of building trust online. So there's a lot of interest in this space and we recognize the importance of artificial intelligence as a looming opportunity and threat. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Choi and Alex will lead us through her presentation. Please put your questions and answers in the um, Q&A box and uh, we'll support you with um, a participatory dialogue as soon as the presentation is complete. Thank you so much, everyone. Over to you, Alex. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Um, can I just confirm, Shannon, that you can see my slides okay? You are online. All right, sounds great. Okay, so uh, thank you, Shannon, for that very lovely introduction. Um, as Shannon mentioned, my name is Dr. Alex Choi. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a medical health officer at Vancouver Coastal Health. I do want to make a disclaimer right at the beginning that I am not an expert. Um, I am not a computer scientist. I am not an AI researcher. I'm a public health practitioner, I'm guessing like many of you, who has been noticing how the world has been changing um, and how the digital landscape has been changing. And I think that this is gonna impact our work. And I do think that it is 
very important that we get ahead of this, um, particularly given that I think there are times in the past, social media is the most recent example, where we have not necessarily been on top of things from the very beginning. Um, and so that's why I really want to have this conver conversation and why we at BCH and in British Columbia have been having this conversation for around the last year and a half, um, trying to make some headway in what is our role when it comes to how the world is changing. And, you know, I think today, because this conversation is, is so big, and even the AI conversation is so big, we've been thinking about, okay, well, you know, for this talk, let's narrow it down a little bit. So I will be mostly talking about AI, but I want to recognize that there's also been a lot of other ways within the digital um, ecosystem that things have changed. I want to start off as we always do in a good way and as we always uh, and as we already have started off with um, acknowledging that I am joining today from the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, and I think, you know, particularly for this area, I think it's really important to think about how these changes are really going to be impacting digital equity and experiences of equity um, across really um, the lifespan. And, and I think that's really a key part of this work. We know that Indigenous peoples are underrepresented in a lot of the data, and as a result, it's, it's biased. And that's a real problem. And so, you know, I think especially when we think about digital equity and AI, it's so important to really center um, the experiences and the importance um, of Indigenous peoples. So I'm going to start off just by having a brief conversation about what is AI. And it, it, it's hard because I think as many of you probably know, we could talk about just this all day. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of great courses out of there, <clears throat> out there. For anyone who's really interested, I would actually really encourage folks to take some of those courses, um, because again, you know, it's it's very difficult to cram into a talk like this. But to start off with, broadly speaking, um, artificial intelligence is the ability to perform tasks usually associated with human intelligence, including the ability to sense, reason, act, and adapt. You know, I think when I first came into this, I, you know, didn't really understand that AI is actually an entire field of study, sort of like math or physics, um, and definitions are still settling. Um, but typically, um, when you think about something like machine learning or deep learning, machine learning is typically thought of as one area of AI. So AI is the big umbrella, um, that's an entire field of study, and then machine learning is a subset. Other subsets include things like robotics or reinforcement learning, um, speech recognition, natural language processing. And the difference is, whereas older technologies required humans to program each step of the process, most of us here probably learned how to code at some point, um, you know, statistical coding or um, other types of code. Um, and, you know, at that point, we really were programming each step of the process. Machine learning differs because it's really where you use data to train a model so that it can actually learn from the data without explicitly being programmed um, at every step of the way. Deep learning then is a more mature version of mature learning, machine learning, sorry, where the machine actually decides whether or not it's right. So it's learning from the data, it's deciding whether or not it's right. And this is enabled by artificial neural networks inspired by the human brain, where you actually create layers of nodes and this enables semi-supervised models. Now, when you think about deep learning, this is generally divided into two categories, um, discriminative and generative. Generative AI is probably something you've heard a lot about. Um, this is, you know, like ChatGPT and Dolly. It provides outputs that are, you know, text or audio or images. And the way it does this is by looking at data that you've given it, learning about patterns, and then generating something new. So again, generally, discriminative, generative. Generative is where you're learning about patterns, generating something new. And discriminative then is when you're learning about labels and making predictions. So outputs usually include things like classifications and probabilities, whereas generative, again, includes outputs like text or audio or images. So, you know, so what? <laughs> like, why is it that we're talking about this today? Well, you know, I personally think um, that this is actually quite important um, because I think there's a lot of ways that this can actually impact our work. I think that, you know, the new technological tools that we now have access to can allow us to find a lot of efficiencies in our work. Things that we've started doing or explored doing include things like automating documentation, you know, documentation for a lot of us 
actually takes up a lot of time, particularly when you think about things like communicable disease documentation or maybe documentation done by our environmental health officers. And a lot of this can now actually be automated using some of these tools. Report generation is another thing that we've looked up, uh, looked at automating. And literature synthesis, you know, we've been, we've gone from being able to do literature synthesis or having to do literature synthesis over weeks or months to really doing it in a matter of seconds. Um, and I'll give some examples as to how we've done that. I think this is a particularly important thing to consider at a time when, you know, we're frequently resource constrained, like let's face it, a lot of us are public sector. Um, and if we really want to expand our reach, particularly to underserved populations, I think it is very important to be efficient. And then, you know, I, met, I, I mentioned at the outset that I do think, if I'm being completely honest here, that we have previously fallen a bit behind in the past. And I wouldn't want to see that happen with AI if we were not on top of the impacts. So, you know, I think about, you know, social media and the fact that it came out 20 years ago and now we're just um, figuring out, you know, what are the mental wellness impacts? Like, what are the impacts on misinformation and disinformation? If I'm being honest, I think we were behind the ball. And, you know, I, I would really hate to see that with AI. I don't think it's a great idea to bury our heads in the sand on this one. So, you know, let's talk about what some of the recent advances have been. You know, within clinical medicine, there are already fairly well-established applications in specialties like radiology. So, you know, like radiological diagnosis and oncology, um, dermatology, pathology, ophthalmology, for instance, you know, detection of diabetic retinopathy. Um, and as one of my colleagues in Ontario actually pointed out recently, JAMA has a recent edition devoted to AI. Um, this is mostly clinical. Um, and, you know, I should say most of this is not real world trials. It's really looking at feasibility um, and really looking at capabilities. Um, but, you know, there's, there's significant growth in this area. I, I've seen a little bit less in public health, um, but we've seen a lot of growth really in every domain that you can look at. Pace and pro of progress in AI has really started to intensify and become much more public over the last year and a half. As many of you will know, this obviously um, really uh, gained a lot of public traction with the release of ChatGBT, which became a driving force, um, with generative AI producing much more than just text and now moving into images and video and audio that you can create with prompts um, via the GPT um, 3.5. Uh, foundation model. Um, some of these, of course, are not open to the public yet, like the video piece, um, but, uh, but these things are very much available and being used and being piloted. Just to give you a taste, because again, I, I think it's very difficult um, to really substantiate all of the things that have happened over the last year and a half, or really the last 10 years, or even more here, um, because this work has been going on for a long time. But, you know, just to give you a taste, um, in January, a chat based, a chatbot based on an LLM created by Google was more accurate than board certified primary care physicians in diagnosing cardiac and respiratory conditions, and actually ranked higher on empathy. As the Nature News article put it, um, a little bit more succinctly and bluntly um, than the actual article itself, Google AI has better bedside manner and makes better diagnoses. Although again, I do wanna point out that this is not yet clinically used and this is purely experimental. Now, while robotics has actually lagged behind somewhat, um, new companies are actually now partnering with tech giants to move these LLM capabilities, those generative AI capabilities that were a subset of deep learning into the real world, like beyond our computer screen. So beyond text and audio and video. Um, this, is, uh, this is a New York Times article about a company called Covariant. Um, where you can see in the in, in the way that it's describing what it's doing, the robot is actually demonstrating the ability to examine a challenge, self-reflect, learn, and improve um, using the same sort of foundation model that's been powering a lot of these advances. And when you look at the timeline, um, especially in the last year and a half, although again, I, I do not want to um, say that this is this is all recent. This has been really working up for many, many years. You, you start to see an enormous growth in the field and enormous investment um, in the field. So, you know, when you look at this timeline, generative AI startups and other companies um, 
developing AI solutions have raised almost 50 billion in 2023. There's enormous investment in this area right now. Many of the tech giants are funding or acquiring AI companies and integrating LLMs into their services. And many of you will probably have noticed this already as things are coming online in the services you use every day from email to search engines. Um, and, you know, even as just a you know, casual chat GBT user um, using it for things outside of work, um, you know, there's been an immense improvement uh, from the release uh, last year in 2022, well, two years ago now in 2022, end of 2022, up until now, there has been fairly immense improvement um, in all of these tools. This is a figure from Time um, that I uh, that I was pointed to by a colleague, uh, Sean Sway at the University of British Columbia. Um, and when you look at performance of AI across domains, the rate of improvement is really increasing. The number of and types of tasks that AI can perform competently is increasing rapidly. And in many areas, it's gone from almost no competency to human level performance in a remarkable amount of time. If you look at you know, the, the things that started at basically zero around 2020 and are now nearing human level performance, um, it, it is really remarkable how far this field has expanded. Now, I do want to say, when I say human level performance, I don't mean that they're better than experts. I don't typically recommend that people use these tools, in fact, in areas where they don't have expertise, because hallucinations do happen. Um, and these things are not completely reliable, like they have weaknesses. Like I, so for those of you who might not know what hallucinations are, um, you know, these, these LLMs are basically generating new ideas all of the time based on that data that it's been given. And sometimes it generates an idea that's incorrect um, in a way, like when you think about how much time it spends generating, it's a bit of a miracle that it's right so much of the time. But because those hallucinations do happen, um, I personally don't typically recommend that people use these tools unless they already have expertise. But for those who do have expertise, I think it's really valuable to start to learn how these tools perform, what their strengths and weaknesses are, because they're changing so rapidly. And as they change, they become more difficult um, to actually understand. And it becomes more difficult to actually detect those weaknesses. So right now, you know, do I believe that Copilot can provide better medical advice than I can? You know, maybe I'm I'm just conceited, but I, I don't think so. Um, but can it write a more entertaining rap about the public health concerns around cat ownership? I think probably, yes. In fact, this is what it generated for me the other day. I particularly like verse three about toxoplasmosis, um, which I find uh, has a much better beat than I could ever come up with. This figure is from um, a, you know, a consulting firm called McKinsey that folks may have heard of, um, talking about the increasing use of AI. And this is a bit old now. Um, so this is, you know, really pretty soon after GPT-3 was released um, to the public. And already there was increasing use of AI in basically every industry. And it has increased even more at this point um, now, you know, about a year later from when this survey was published. Um, and, you know, I think it's important, again, to think about, you know, what percentage of us and our staff use generative AI tools regularly, because to use it well, you really need to understand the strengths and the weaknesses. Um, I think consensus is forming that, you know, there's a lot of people talk about jobs, and I honestly am not sure that it's reasonable um, for us to really make much comment in this area. Is there probably going to be a change? Yeah. Uh, do we have a lot of information at this point about net loss or net gain? I find that still very difficult to comment on. But I think consensus is forming that, you know, even if, um, you know, no matter what the change, being good at using AI may become quite important in the coming years. And so, you know, just in terms of workforce capacity, I think it's really important for us to understand these tools, to figure out what the strengths and weaknesses are of these tools, which again is much easier to understand at an earlier point compared to a later point. Um, and to make sure, you know, because I, I think there is a prospect that the public sector could fall behind the private sector as we do in many ways. So again, you know, we come back to the so what, and I really do think that there are efficiencies that can be found here. And I think it's really important that we don't bury our heads in the sand. 
So let's start talking a little bit around how we can leverage AI to make our work better. And here, you know, again, I'm mostly talking about generative AI, but I'm also talking about other types of tools. You know, in the surveillance area, there's a lot of teams that are already using machine learning and more advanced techniques in order to solve different problems. And that's part of this too. Um, within healthcare, again, there's growing energy around using AI in areas, in areas that are currently under-resourced and understaffed. Um, a lot of this has been centered around acute and clinical care. But given our broader impact in public health, I think it's incredibly important that public health practitioners start thinking about how we can leverage these tools. And, you know, I, I do want to say, like, before we go ahead and use them, there's a lot of things that we have to do. We have to think about governance. We have to think about, like, what is the ethical use of these tools? But in order to do that, we need to start thinking about how we can leverage these tools so we can start having those discussions and we can start going down this road. Because even in areas that are reasonably well resourced, we found that there's a lot that AI can contribute. So for example, we found that AI scribes can listen to client encounters and deliver automated notes in a required format that can free up hours of time for patient-centered care. Um, you know, really like removing that screen interaction. So we get back to listening to patients, addressing fears and concerns, working on social factors. Um, and there may be additional communication skills needed to adequately communicate risks and discuss trade-offs with clients. But again, we think that this can be an enormous efficiency um, if we choose to use it. In surveillance also, you know, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities to leverage these tools to automate some routine tasks while also using them to deepen our insights. But, but I do want to say that, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of these discussions just happen in the surveillance world. And for me, myself, I, I think that's a mistake. I think that this has deep implications for surveillance, but I do also think that this has deep implications for other types of public health work where we can, again, find these efficiencies. So just to give some examples of applications that some of us are using um, or could be using. Um, I know many teams across the country have started using these, and so I just thought that I'd bring some of these up. Hopefully folks are familiar with some of these, but if we're not, that's why we're here today. Um, so, you know, just to highlight a couple, um, you know, within the surveillance area recently in BC, we've been using these tools to predict the number of lives saved through our Take Home Naloxone program, solving that really classic public health problem of not being able to prove something that didn't happen. Um, the team at BCDC has also been using it to predict denominators, um, for instance, the size of GBS MSM populations for some of our surveillance tools. Um, but again, I don't think that these are limited to just surveillance tools that we can use um, technological advances for. So just to give kind of a concrete example, and I've, I've listed some here again, um, but just to give some concrete examples, I'll pull over my slide here. Um, so this is when we're talking about um, briefing notes or proposals or letters and how these tools can help us. Um, I typed in, you know, a very basic prompt um, saying that, you know, you're writing a letter to a mayor in a formal but succinct tone about the expansion of priority bus lanes with health messaging explaining the importance of public transportation for public health. I don't know about you, um, but here in BC, this is something advocating for active transportation with our municipal governments is something we do pretty often. And these letters take a non-zero amount of time to generate um, when we're trying to do this advocacy work and using letters to support our appearances at uh, city council meetings and things like that. So here, and I have to admit, you know, if we were to, we could have an entire session on how we could actually make this prompt better and how to make this language better, um, because there are very evidence-based ways of doing that that have been well documented in the literature. However, for the sake of simplicity, so you could actually see the prompt, I kept it simple for now. And you could see, even with that, it does pull out some pretty good stuff. You know, it pulls out some of the stuff that I would have spoken about, things like um, air quality, you know, we could always um, add it, you know, prompted to add in climate change considerations into that, physical activity promotion, equitable access to services, um, traffic safety and injury prevention, um, social connections and mental health. And it also pulls out, you know, some reasonable uh, citations um, from CDC, um, and other areas. Uh, it frequently pulls, I, I think especially um, if you prompt it to, it can pull from the types of sources that you like. Um, but if you don't like them, the other thing, you know, I mentioned literature synthesis, you can go into a tool like Consensus. 
um, and type in here. I've typed in, does public transit decrease injuries compared to driving personal cars? So say I want to really bulk up that paragraph or bulk up those points, depending if I'm just doing a letter or a report. Um, and it comes with, okay, so from the Journal of Urban Health, city bus travel is safer mode. Um, if you want an actual number, you know, an, another journal article, 34 citations, public tra transit has about one tenth the traffic casualty rate. Um, you know, I know it's from 2014, so I can also go to the top and filter and say, you know, I just want things from that are more recent. I want things with more citations. And then you can also click this button and have it synthesize for you um, so that it can come up with a quick summary. Um, or if you want to pull citations, it's very easy to do so. So these are some just, you know, very simple ways um, that you could potentially increase efficiency in work. Um, you know, other ways that we've been using this or hearing about this being used, um, and I use the royal we here, you know, I don't do much coding anymore, um, but in speaking to a lot of our EPIs, um, we've heard from a lot of teams that are using um, these tools to write code. Um, so using Copilot uh, to write R code, to structure tables. Um, there's a lot that can be done with this. Um, creating health promotion materials, again, because these tools can do um, you know, videos, poster campaigns in a matter of seconds. Videos do take a little bit longer, um, but uh, you know, image generation is very, very quick. Um, you can also use AI tools to conduct jurisdictional scans of web pages, social media to help inform emerging opportunities. This is one of the projects that our public health surveillance unit um, team has ongoing right now. Um, and you know, in the wider world, of course, like I myself, I don't do vaccine development, but it's very important to me that we have good develop uh, vaccine development pathways. And one of the really exciting things um, in this world, you know, to me, one of the most exciting things that AI has done for us um, is the program AlphaFold um, that. Uh, enables um, prediction of protein structures that have really increased the speed of vaccine development. And you can also use these tools for phylogenetic analysis and immune repertoire analysis uh, within vaccine development. Um, and, and it's really you know, sped along some of these processes, particularly in an age of mRNA vaccines. And again, you know, why is this important? I really think, again, AI tools have immense potential for improving the efficiency of public health practice, allowing us to spend more time supporting vulnerable and marginalized clients. So why is this important? I, You know, a lot of this comes down to me, like equity. That's why this is important, and that's why this can really help our work. But just to switch gears very slightly, because, you know, I think that this can also be a double-edged sword. Um, everything can, right? The internet, social media, a lot of the um, advances that came before this one, I think they've been double-edged swords. Can can they really impact the efficiency of our work and help us to be more effective? Absolutely. Have they been universally positive? I, I don't know about that. You know, I, I do think almost everything has some negatives and positives. Um, and so when we think about AI, you know, I think we should think about how we can incorporate it into our public health work to make our work better. But I also think we need to think about how is how are broader changes in the rest of society really impacting the health of our populations? Because, you know, if it impacts the determinants of health, and I don't know how it cannot impact the determinants of health, that is also going to impact our work. There's been some um, work on this already. So as you heard from Shannon, you know, digital equity has been um, you know, an issue that's discussed for a long, long time. And there's all sorts of ways that digital advances impact the terms of health and health equity. Um, this is from you know, a great paper um, about you know, using that rainbow that we're all accustomed to, thinking about how every part of that rainbow will really be impacted by digital advances. And if we start thinking about this, so, you know, when we started out on this journey in BC, this is really what we started with. Okay, you know, we have these great frameworks for thinking about how the determinants of health impact the health of our populations. Will AI affect this? And as we went through that rainbow, I think in every single area, we started thinking, you know, this could really go both ways. Um, given the profound societal shifts that AI can bring about, the negative repercussions by poorly managed AI policies could be monumental. At the same time, it's really crucial to effectively mitigate these adverse effects so that we can fully harness the positive potential. 
acknowledging that achieving this balance is a complex yet essential task. So, you know, when we think about, say, education, key determinant, you know, AI can create tailored educational programs that adapt to individual learning styles. And we've already started to see this happening. This is in the literature already. At the same time, you know, if we have unequal access to AI-based tools and resources, we could widen the digital divide and really exacerbate existing education inequalities. Really, this could go both ways. And so we th started thinking about all of the impacts in, for each of the different determinants, we had a 20 page document that we are working through. And we are trying to narrow it down because, you know, we, we felt like we were in this space similar to 20, 30 years ago when we started working on climate change as a community. And we said to ourselves, oh my goodness, this is so big. How are we going to figure out where we need to act? And, you know, to me, it seemed like when we were actually able to coalesce around what are the major health risks, it became much easier. We could think to ourselves, okay, heat is a major risk we can work on heat. Um, and, you know, we started thinking, maybe we want to do the same thing with AI. This is such a massive issue. Let's start thinking about what are the major health risks. So we went through this whole process of looking at it through different frameworks. And these are some of the more important ones that we started to come up with. We started to think about embedding systemic bias, exacerbating inequities, changing social development infrastructure, and perpetuating misinformation and disinformation. As some of the major issues that we saw in terms of potential threats and well-being impacts um, of AI on population health. So what does this look like? So embedding systemic bias, you know, we know that data is already biased. We know that our data sets are not perfect. They are not perfectly representative. Um, and the problem is that when you, when AI uses these, it can actually internalize and amplify these biases. AI bias is not like human bias, right? <laughs> it's not that these um, algorithms, that these models are inherently biased, but there are various ways you can make them biased. Um, there's a few types of AI bias that people will talk about, data-driven bias, human bias, algorithmic bias. Um, and again, you know, these are not the same as human biases, but, you know, just to talk about data-driven bias is probably one of the ones that's most talked about. If AIs are trained on data that is biased, they will be biased too. Because you remember back to that first slide we had about how AI works. Um, you know, you give it data and it figures out how to generate things or make predictions and it learns based on that data. So if the data is bad, your results are gonna be bad. So, you know, there's all sorts of examples of this. Um, bias in, bias out is, you know, one of, is, is I think a pretty good way of thinking about it. Um, you know, I think in the, in the wider world, we can think about, you know, a very often told story about um, Amazon trying to use AI for hiring and finding that it only hired men because they looked at how applicants had been vetted for the previous 10 years and most came from men. So it actually decided that anything that was a female skewing trait um, in CVs was actually a negative trait. And, um, and this of course called caused a giant kerfuffle. Um, but it's actually also very difficult to fix. So more recently, you may have heard of Gemini's attempt. So Gemini is Google's tool. Um, you might've heard of Gemini's attempt to actually uh, try and address this um, and trying really hard to reflect diversity. Um, and actually it's led to the creation of quite a few inaccuracies as a result of that attempt. So preserving the accuracy of these models while and effectiveness of these models while actually addressing these issues has turned out to be quite challenging. Um, in the healthcare world, so not the public health world right now, but the healthcare world, you know, there's also, um, you know, this article uh, is one that was published about an AI-driven skin tech uh, cancer detection algorithm, which was trained on data sets disproportionately comprised of patients with lighter skin tones because that was what was available. And it led to reduced accuracy for the detection of skin cancer for those with darker skin. And again, this leads you to think about, okay, what is the data currently being generated um, and is it representative of our population? And I would say it's probably not because most of our data is on wealthier places and people and really actually leaves out a lot of equity deserving populations and people in lower resource settings. And so you can see how these types of algorithmic biases specifically targeting those who are less likely to be represented. So, you know, lower SES, living in a rural area, perhaps non-ideal, even broadband internet access, non-white race could really exacerbate systemic racism in our system or widen it. 
part of the problem with this is that it can actually be very difficult to see because again, AI bias is not the same as human bias. They rely on very large multifaceted data training sets and due to the sheer size of the data sets and the opaque nature of machine learning, algorithms in these biases can go unnoticed because they actually um, take different things out of the data sets than we do as humans. So for instance, this is a paper about how AI models can accurately predict self-reported race using just chest X-rays, also using just mammograms or cervical spine radiographs or chest CTs, regardless of the type of scan or anatomic location. And this is just not possible for human experts. So when we put all of this data into these AIs, it's very possible that race information could be unknowingly incorporated um, into models without us knowing it, potentially exacerbating, again, racial disparities in the medical setting and outside, both of which would impact population health. As a result of some of these findings, um, you know, this is uh, this is draft regulations from Quebec um, that were put out in 2023, December, um, about regulations respecting the anonymization of personal information. This is the acknowledgement again that increasingly powerful computing capabilities raised doubts about the extent to which previously long-held privacy techniques will be effective. Um, Non-personal information can sometimes enter these systems and some folks posit that personal information can actually be spit out because again, these, um, these systems are not like us. They detect different things than we do. And again, um, you know, emerging AI systems, and I, I, I know I keep on saying this, but I, I think it's because it's really important. Um, our AI systems are being trained on our current data sets and literature that often mirror existing biases in our society. If this is not addressed, this can worsen the existing disparities, socioeconomic or otherwise. You know, there are ways that AI can actually be used to improve equity, you know, bridging gaps in access, um, but... There is also a discernible discrepancy in access to digital technologies that already exist. And there is a real possibility that we had amplified the digital divide along axes like age, ethnicity, SES, geographical location. Growth may also be dis may also disproportionately benefit privileged populations. So we imagine, you know, if we continue with our current digital divide, like a lot of these tools are probably going to mostly mostly benefit those who are already privileged, those who already have access. Um, and, you know, this could lead to even more of a divide in the types of infrastructure that are av available in resource poor areas, leading to even deeper inequities where some populations will have access to benefits while others will not. And these sorts of things are starting to potentially be a little bit worrying um, because, you know, we're, we're also seeing um, things like this article, which was published in The Garden recently, looking at um, San Jose's local government's invitation to tech, tech companies to recognize homelessness encampments. Um, and of course, with that comes the worry, well, how is this information going to be used precisely? Um, and a lot of folks think that this is going to be used to target already um, you know, equity-seeking populations. I also think that when we start to think about this, we really need to think about the, deter the commercial determinants of health. Um, you may or may not have heard of companies like Anthropic, which is the middle, um, which is the middle logo, OpenAI, which I think most people have heard of by now. Um, these companies, um, you know, are the main. Uh, I, I put them here because these are the main models that are out there. So the main foundation models out there, um, which you know, cost an immense, immense amount of money in terms of the computing power um, are probably Gemini from Google, Claude from Anthropic, um, and of course, chat GB, uh, GBT or GBT, um, whichever version you use um, from OpenAI. So, you know, you may or may not have heard of these companies, but you have definitely heard of their major financial backers because they are the existing tech giants, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. Um, there's a lot to dig into here, but and, you know, I think it's interesting to note that many AI systems have been developed using the unpaid, unrecognized contributions of a lot of folks, whether they be artists, writers, authors, laborers, transferring the wealth to large corporations and owners of AI systems. Um, but I think it's also very interesting to note that the direction of a lot of AI progress is currently being driven by several tech giants. 
You know, history is riddled with examples um, in public health, like tobacco, where a misalignment between commercial interests and public health led to significant population health impacts. And with leadership challenges that occurred at OpenAI last year, we saw that when there was a conflict between the public good, potentially, and commercial interests, commercial interests seemed to win out, despite the fact that the company was structured to, to, to specifically safeguard against that. And, you know, again, if we go back to, you know, the x-ray race example and think about the data can be extrapolated from increasingly powerful systems, I think it's interesting to think about how this data might be used given powerful commercial interests. The New York Times recently reported on vehicle manufacturers um, and how they're sharing driving information with data brokers who then share information with insurance companies. And this is data that's pretty detailed, like trip start times, end times, braking, sharp accelerations. And this is being used to raise insurance prices or deny insurance. And even though these companies say that, that they have driver's permission to do so, the reporting is that no one knew this because the existence of these partnerships is nearly invisible to consumers um, whose consent is obtained in the fine print. And being realistic, you know, many of us don't read that. Switching gears, because I, I, I just want to recognize, I know we have a limited amount of time today together. And so I just want to kind of provide a broad overview. We could talk about this all day. Um, but, you know, we also start to worry that there may be misalignment incentives, commercial incentives that could impact the information environment. Some people have described the shifting role of technology and the way information spreads in two phases, the ranking of information through technology. Um, so this is like algorithms, it's just what happens on YouTube or what you get on social media, and then the creation of information as it's starting to occur now. So up until now, in my opinion, we've seen misalignment in that first phase where social media's advertisement-based revenue model sometimes neglects accuracy in favor of sensationalism to maximize engagement. Um, but with the creation of information using new tools, there is even greater risk, in my opinion, of risk, risk of misinformation through generating deep fake content, amplifying misinformation, generating false narratives. And I think, you know, I, at least like this is very raw in my mind, because we, in my mind, again, really struggled with misinformation during the pandemic, whether that be about vaccines, misinformation about non pharmaceutical and interventions. And I would suggest that we fell somewhat behind, given that all of this started happening 20 years ago. I would suggest that we fell behind in how we responded to social media. And I think it's important to think about, you know, what is the impact of the next stage in misinformation and disinformation? The next thing that, again, I briefly want to touch on is just social infrastructure. So we all know that social connections have a huge impact on health. But while technology has enabled us to communicate more effectively over time and space, the transition from digital and often asynchronous inf interactions has changed how social connections form. Many will now be familiar with U.S. Surgeon General's, uh, General's advisory on social media that came out last year and other reports like it, like this one from the National Academy of Sciences, finding that children and adolescents who spend greater than three hours a day of social media have double the risk of mental health issues um, like anxiety and depression. Um, again, Facebook was founded 20 years ago. I, I worry that, you know, publishing a report and finding these things 20 years later, we could be a little behind and I worry it could be the same for AI. You know, I, I think about how things have changed, how we've gone from seeing one another face to face and having most of our social interactions happen that happen that way to talking on the phone, to then texting, to now interacting with one another's images and posts on social media, to now interacting with non-humans. Um, you know, I'm probably a little bit too old to have AI friends, but this is something that we're starting to see in younger people. Um, and again, I want to say double-edged sword. AI can enable real-time translation, fostering cross-cultural interactions and understanding. However, um, you, you wonder where, you know, as the popularity of AI-powered platforms increase, which there's a growing consensus among experts that this is a near-term certainty, um, decreased human connection if it replaced human connection, could impact health and development. And in an era where we're seeing 
increasing issues with loneliness, mental wellness, and unhealthy coping mechanisms, like some of them we'll be talking about later this week in, in public health week, like substance use, you do have to worry about the impact of something that can so fundamentally alter human to human interactions. Um, this is an article from CBC um, and a, a screenshot of what this platform looks like um, within Snapchat. Um, many social platforms now have this, um, an AI chatbot that, uh, that people, and I would say particularly younger people, are starting to engage with. I also wanted to mention climate change. So, you know, I think that there is acknowledgement now that this is a significant climate change issue because training a single big language model is associated with, that, with about 300,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide, and this may increase as compute power increases. Um, a single training session of GPT-3 requires the energy equivalent of the annual consumption of about 126 homes. Um, and there are a lot of issues that I, other issues that, you know, don't fall in the neat box that I, that I think are kind of overarching issues that we need to keep an eye on. Things like accountability, um, regulation involvement of the public sector is not necessarily keeping pace with the, with how quickly this is moving, um, especially with those tech giants. Transparency and explainability, um, you know, I, I started to say, and again, we talk about this all day, um, but there's not a lot of transparency. And a lot of these models are working in ways that not even the creators can explain right now. Um, and to me, that's a bit of a problem. <laughs> uh, because if we don't know how they work, and we can't explain how they work, you know, we really need to be able to detect weaknesses and strengths. And finally, privacy. You know, I think there's a lot of interesting conversations starting around um, new tools um, that are being used, like facial recognition uh, technology in public spaces. There's again that question: Are we putting in non-private um, personal information and getting personal information out because these systems don't work like humans do? There's a lot of things to dig into here. Fortunately, um, you know, as a community, we have started to dig in. Um, the WHO has started to look at um, what we need to start doing as a public health community. Um, and in Canada, may have, many of you may have heard about ADA. Um, it's part of Bill C-27, the Digital Charter Implementation Act. Um, some folks do not think it goes far enough. Um, and I will say that it does worry me that it the advisory council is currently dominated by industry and academic voices with no participation from important sectors that will be definitely affected. Um, it, to me, like, you know, I, I think this council really needs to be well equipped to prioritize the public interest. And it's unclear to me if this is happening right now, which is why um, NBC, PHABC submitted on all of our community's behalf, um, a list of recommendations as to what we felt needed to change in ADA. Um, some of the things that I will flag are things like, you know, what, um, what systems need to be mitigated. I would I would say that it probably needs to be a bit broader um, because it was really just high impact systems. Um, it needs to include public sector actors like health. Um, it needs to also, again, um, be driven by more than just um, the, you know, the academics and uh, industry representatives who are wonderful um, and very, very skilled. But I would, I would, again, posit that this is going to affect much more than just them. And there needs to be more diverse membership on this committee that is deciding what this regulation is going to be. Um, if you'd like to take a look at this, it, it is publicly available online. Um, there are also a number of very uh, thoughtful commentaries uh, that are also available on um, the website uh, for the, um, if you, if you look at the federal aid, uh, website for the committee considering ADA, all of these um, submissions have been posted on there, including ours. Um, and if folks are interested, I'd encourage you to take a look at them. So this brings us to, you know, what are we doing right now? And I think there's a number of really great partnerships that have started to be formed. Um, I would flag um, just quick shout out to Ontario um, with the work that we're doing with Toronto Public Health and Comiskoka, Wealth Dufferin, Wealth uh, Dufferin, um, uh, in terms of how we're starting to look at how we would incorporate this into routine public health functions. Um, so, you know, some of these AI powered EMRs are one of the things that we've looked at. Um, in other areas of work, we've also started looking at, and, and this is to Shannon's point from the beginning, the conference that we had where we were looking at prototyping new tools, learning workshops, um, looking at uh, the assessment and adoption of adequate infrastructure, which is really going to be needed. And 
simultaneously looking at the population health impacts, because again, you know, just like a lot of things in public health, these are not all our domain, but they certainly are going to, to impact our population and the health of our population. And so we've started to figure out, you know, what are we, like, how are we defining this? How are we exploring this? And what is within our realm? Um, so, you know, we, we have a recent commentary that was published in CJPH um, that I encourage folks to take a look at. The submission, um, to the proposed uh, Artificial Intelligence and Data Act, also available publicly if folks would like to take a look, um, and the systemic identification of public health responses and priorities for coordinated advocacy. I will stop there. Um, I, I really thank you all for joining us today um, and invite you to reach out um, if anyone has any questions. I know that was a whirlwind. Um, there's a lot to cover in an hour slot on this topic and we tried to curate it and give folks just a bit of a smattering um, of everything that's happening in the world, but it, it's a lot. And so, you know, if there's interest um, in speaking further, we encourage folks to reach out. Um, we're very happy um, to engage and uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Alex. And, you know, Alex um, was really clear to say they're not an expert. And I, I certainly understand what expert means in AI. And there are layers and layers and layers of, of um, um, roles and um, academic work and research work, R&D. But I have to say that what Alex brings to us is a thought leadership that is really quite extraordinary in terms of grasping both the opportunities that exist and the challenges that are in front of us. Um, we do have um, questions from uh, participants, but I wanted to um, draw your attention, Alex, to um, a concern that has arisen around medical legal um, challenges arising from use of AI in either diagnoses or privacy concerns, um, uh, population studies and surveillance. And I think there was a very good submission to Ada on some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be great for you before we move into the other questions, just to frame that a little bit, because we operate under legislation and under specific authorities with specific protections included. And so I think that will be helpful to the public health workforce. Um, but a huge thank you to you for the scope and scale of what you presented today. It is an overwhelming topic. And uh, I think you did a great job conceptualizing and bringing the threads together for us um, and the potential impacts for public health. So I'll turn it back to you to respond to that query. Thanks. Thanks, Shannon. Um, it's a complex issue. <laughs> like, I think there are so many threads to this issue. Um, one is, you know, what is the liability for things that um, these tools could spit out? Um, and I think for that one, again, I, I think Shannon pointed to a really thoughtful submission um, to that ADA legislation um, that I would I would turn folks to. CMPA has also come out with some um, with some stuff around this. And I think from our perspective, in terms of how our our teams might be using these tools, we've been very careful to say, you know, these are tools tools. These are not things that we should be relying on um, to provide excellent, you know, expert information, which is why I say, you know, I, I really encourage people to use these only in areas where they already have expertise, because the tool is not the expert. You are the expert and you are ultimately responsible for, you know, the, the end product. Um, this is just a tool to use in your work as anything else would be. I also really encourage folks to, if there are questions, incorporate their um, privacy departments, because, you know, I, I think there are so many dimensions to this. Thinking about, you know, how those information flows occur, like most of these tools have information flows, not just to the company that has the tool, but also to the foundation model that provides the you know, underlying engine for how that work is being done. There's so many complex issues. I, I would just really encourage you um, to loop them in. Um, so I know, Shannon, that only touches on the surface. It's such a big issue. Um, but I would really start there and thinking about how we're using them. Um, I, I, I did see some questions in the chat. Right. Um, so we're just going to turn to that. Yeah. And uh, and wonderfully, we did have an important question about commercial determinants of health, yeah. which will be the subject of our next conference. And so thank you for that, letting me flag that. And Alex, I wonder if you want to reply to that query, in particular, the notion of um, a, a recursive loop happening with an AI model. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I completely agree. That's one of the biggest uh, reasons why I think it's so important to be timely in our response. Because I think the longer we leave this, 
the more potential is for this to become a loop, for this to start to feed off of itself, um, and for more of those industry influences to get ahead of how we are regulating. So I... 100% agree with all of these points, right? I do think that many people believe um, that either this has already started to happen, where some of these contents have started to be pulled from a loop, or that it will happen. Like a lot of this is future facing, right? So I, I don't have a crystal ball, I can't read the future, but certainly this is something that is a lot of folks are worried about. And that skewing of um, how um, how information is available online. This is something that is already happening. <laughs> like, I, I just want to emphasize that. Again, if we look at those two, um, those two phases, one where, where the technology is being used to curate information and one that's being used to create information, we have already seen this being skewed in both areas. This is not a future state. This is, is right now. And that is why I'm really concerned. Because if we do not get ahead of this, we are leaving us open to really what the industry, um, you know, how the industry is motivated to act. And right now they're motivated to really, you know, impact their bottom line. And I would say that there are a lot of areas, including this one, where that incentive does not line up with our incentives of actually providing factual health information to the public. We've already seen this happen with social media. I We've already started to see this happen with, um, with the creation of content. I, I didn't explain the photo because we were starting to get to the end of time and I want to be sensitive to that. But uh, one of the photos that I pulled um, was from uh, a Ron DeSantis um, post and it contained a lot of this generated content. And again, that content is being used to drive a narrative that is not necessarily consistent with truth or truthful public health information. So I absolutely think this is a key concern. And that's why I, I know we didn't have time to talk about it in a fulsome way um, because there's so much to discuss, but I really think that this is one of the most important things that we need to keep our eye on. We respect and understand that the um, generation of truths is a major threat to democracy. And we actually had a presentation at the conference on the politics of the internet. And we are, we are very clear about the threats that um, exist for us. And as you mentioned in your um, presentation, Alex, looking at what's coming ahead with the campaign. Um, I think there's another, um, you know, connected to that is the concern that people have about um, how they can officially use tools. And we've got a great question here from an environmental health officer about what, what's legitimate in the workplace and how do I do this? And is there a policy in my health authority? What kind of leadership do we need from our governance structures in terms of the appropriate use of these tools? And how can we as policymakers provide support to folks so that they can um, use a tool appropriately. And following your most recent comment, the dangers of efficiencies that are drawn from solutions which are derived from bias systems is another significant mm -hmm. threat. And so I'm asking you, Alex, in two minutes or less, to sort of hold the legislative grounding that we need or the governance grounding that we need to be mindful and vigilant about some of those challenges. And today's presentation is just one step we can take, but there are others I think we're mindful of. So if I could invite you to comment on that, that would be so appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. And, and you know, I think there really is a role for both kind of parties there. I think, you know, on a... Um, as a as a society, we need to we need to decide what is the accepted use of these, um, what constitutes high risk use, how do we need mitigation me measures to be in place, and then there's also um, kind of what I was thinking about from the question in the chat about kind of more personal use. And I think with personal use at work, I think there are governance frameworks that are needed. These are starting at least in the spaces where I work, where we're coming together with all of the involved folks, um, privacy and legal and, you know, everyone involved in IMIDS to really talk about, you know, what how do we anticipate these things being used? What is appropriate use? What is inappropriate use? So you'll notice maybe in the um, in the prompts that I pulled up on the screen very briefly, I did not identify who I was, where I was, what kind of role I was in, what kind of project I was doing, um, because I do think we need to stay away from including those kind of 
identifiers when we're using these systems, particularly if you're using a public one. I was actually not using a public one um, when I pulled that up. I was using um, an enterprise version of it. Um, but, uh, but you know, for folks who might be using, um, particularly things like ChatGPT, um, I think it's really important to be careful of that and, and for organizations to really spend time thinking about right now, um, what is appropriate use and what are guidelines for appropriate use? Um, I know we have some of these tables coming up. Um, you know, again, I, I, I invite collaboration if folks are interested in, in talking. Um, I would really encourage folks not to hide what they're doing um, because I think it's important that we have open, transparent conversations about what appropriate use is and put adequate guardrails on this. Um, because, you know, I think a lot of people talk about ChatGPT, but ChatGPT is the, at the tip of the iceberg here. There's a lot of enterprise solutions um, that are being considered. And I think these are ones that we need to be really thoughtful about and really thoughtful about what guardrails are we putting up and which tools are we selecting to make sure that we're doing this in the most positive way possible. Shen, I think you're muted. Sorry, my machine was uh, double clicking. <laughs> Me. Let me just say thank you so much. We have one minute left and I am so grateful to you for your thought leadership, for um, the presentation that you provided, for the pathways that you're helping us to navigate. I really also want to acknowledge that the ADA submission was a huge collaboration and uh, there were so many wonderful folks who spent time and um, to, to contribute to the identification of the challenges and threats ahead of us. Keep watching the space at PHABC. We will be helping to share information on this uh, issue. And thank you so much to CPHA for creating room for us in Canada Public Health Week to center this discourse. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Ian. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Appreciate you very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone.